why don't we oh you have it good the book title I think is um, uh, can you read all this uh, <laughs> it's a, a plague of well I cannot read from my angle okay uh, anyhow the book describes uh, what the Japanese military did using chemical weapon, used jam, uh, germ uh, warfare, and particularly experiment on human during the war. Uh, those atrocities. Again, the newly elected Prime Minister Abe denied them, denies them. Okay? Now, here on my computer, let's switch to com computer th uh, three. On uh, my computer, okay, uh, I hope you can see this. These are newspapers published. It says Japan's Auschwitz. Why do they use that kind of title? Because they want to contrast Japan with Germany. Germany, of course, we all know Auschwitz is awful, but the German government has accepted it. Okay, the responsibility, acknowledged the crime, apologized, and even compensated the victims. Whereas Japan, to this day, still deny they did anything wrong. Now, if the United States at this point, for whatever reason, is afraid of the rise of China in its economical power, siding with Japan in a military sort of a, uh, alliance, I couldn't think of the, the good consequences. Would you be able to think of the good consequences? And particularly under this new leadership of Shinzo Abe? So, this protest or rally, okay, although it's one event in New York, but it was not only in New York. I can also show you before this February, in fact, in the last year, there were many protests worldwide. Okay, this one I happen to have. Um, okay, um, I don't want to say which city because I can't remember and uh, I don't want to misquote. Uh, that doesn't matter. It certainly, it's you know all over the place. Let me show you another one. Okay, this one, uh, I don't know whether I can blow this up. Uh, usually you could, but once you blow up, it's fuzzy because, yeah, you see, this is my computer graphics. Yeah, this is probably okay. All right. Now, let's see. Another one. Look at it. I think this might be in California. As, as if I recall, okay? Another picture, right? So, uh, I am not doing real justice to these demonstrators because I just collected this you know, my computer not in a very organized way, and I apologize. I have a kind of poor vision, and this picture icon is small. I, I can't really uh, find them easily. I should have done is really prepare a well ordered uh, PowerPoint sequence and uh, deliver a illustration to you. Okay, and but I thought it's because the 
the events uh, recently happened, and uh, I, I'm more anxious to tell you than to go prepare a some kind of document. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, sort of a um, instant play. Okay, hopefully you, uh, you forgive me on that. All right. So we had these speakers. Okay, including there's a one interesting. Uh, uh, paper written by a professor who's supposed to be speaker at this rally. And his name is Professor James Shung, a professor at New York University. But uh, for some re uh, reason, he was unable to make it to the rally that day. So some organizers uh, asked me whether I could deliver this uh, speech for him. And I was happy to, to accept that because I certainly want to help, uh, particularly after reading his, his paper. I would actually uh, really enjoyed. The paper's title is A Tale of Two Japans, One Beautiful and One Ugly. Will the beautiful Japan please stand up? What a beautiful title. And captures the whole essence of about this whole uh, rally and the protest. We all know, as I said before, in every country, we have lots of good people. It's not every country is, is full of you know, evil people. In Japan, there are beautiful parts of Japan. So when I read this, I agreed to do this for him. But then, when I read through, it's six full pages. Okay, I can I can scroll down for you, from you know historically talking about it, and then talk about the territorial uh, aggression of the Jap Japanese, and then also talk about uh, the Japanese, the good part of it. honest people, wrote history, wrote books, talk about these issues, okay, and. Uh, as well as the, the sort of international legal, you know, uh, description and so on and so forth and history. So it's a long article of six pages. And yet, in this rally, <laughs> we have so many speakers that is there. And uh, the organizer said, can you deliver that in three minutes? <laughs> so uh, I had to... Uh, uh, forget about this uh, paper and just give three minutes, you know, uh, whatever I think I should say in passion manner. Okay, here's me being the speaker. So I was involved and I can feel how people feel. And I want to convey this to you as American to American. This is serious. Americans cannot go and encourage other countries to become okay, aggressors, resurge their militarism to threaten their neighbors. Japan has territorial dispute with Russia, with Korea, with China, Taiwan. So when ape comes to the United States and in that CSIS conference untitled, sometimes a title of a speech really do reflect someone's, you know, what's thinking. His title of a speech is Japan, uh, Japan is back. When I read that, okay, there, you know, you can go on internet search and you can find it. I say, what do you mean Japan is back? Back to what? If you 
really realize that we are protesting against the resurgence of Japanese militarism, Japan is back and hit right on. And then the content in the speech exactly reinforces the concern and worry we have. Because he's again saying Japan is back to take control or to have a role in Pacific in Asia. The tone is such that now Japan is back to set the rules. What rules? We have United Nations. We have diplomatic relations. We have treaties. We have agreements. It's not for one country, even United States. We don't just go not to another place and say, we going to dictate everything. But that tone in that speech, Japan is back, is totally unacceptable. Of course, these protests, this rally, the people didn't know that he would give that speech in the three days later after this rally. So when this come out on the internet, when people read that, it completely, completely sort of a, uh, supported everyone who participated in this rally. They now believe not only they should do this, now they should encourage everyone else to understand the whole matter. And that's the reason I am here devoting my show one hour to tell you this. As I said before, the Chinese Americans, they are usually not very politically oriented. I may give a few dollars to one candidate, I may just go listen to a couple of town hall meetings. Usually don't go out of the way to do, you know, demonstrations. This event signifies lots of people realize this behavior that Japan is taking a turn and possibly now encouraged by our government, United States, is dangerous. Now, as a citizen, as whether you are originally from this nationality or not, you are now Americans. We have to think about Americans' you know, welfare. What is in it for Americans to encourage Japan to become aggressor again? You know, Cynically, I'm not the one to, to say it first, and many probably literatures you can find, is that say, in the United States, there is a military complex, or called military industry, industrial complex, let's call it. These are the industry make weapons. They make a lot of money by selling weapons. Now, where are the weapons are used? They're used when there is war. So, if there will be war in Pacific Asia, there will be more weapons sold. In fact, this is exactly the purpose that Abe comes to Washington. He wants to get permission to buy weapons, to 
to enlarge and build up their military forces and change them to offensive from defense. I don't think we Americans want to just make money on weapons without, without thinking about justice. That's why I and many people feel compelled in engaging in this activity. <laughs> I've been here <laughs> so many years, <laughs> I don't think ever walk on the street to demonstrate and be a speaker on a political topic. But this time I did it because it is a very important topic and we all should think about it. Now, suddenly some people say, well, China is rising. Will China threaten American security? I would say the other way. If China is rising and threaten American security, why don't we think about whether Japan if given that permission, the freedom to build up military forces would threaten United States security. And this so-called joint security, you know, defense security uh, treaty between Japan and United States was done, of course, during the Cold War uh, with the purpose against Soviet Union. Now, the Cold War is ended, Soviet Union is sort of, you know, disintegrated. There's no reason for U.S. and Japan to convert a defense-oriented treaty into a aggressive, offense-oriented treaty directing to a single country who has not shown in history any invasion to any country other than eons ago. People remember these Mongolians, but they are not even Chinese. China has been always be able to absorb aggressors and convert them to be peaceful people, like the Mongolians. So, in that sense, I just feel we now have the access to information, and the internet provides means for communication, we have to pay attention to these. Although we realize that everybody okay, is busy, and particularly in a time with bad economy, people are busy managing their own lives. But whatever that life, compared to what the country is heading to, what the future is, I think is still very clear to me. We have to pay attention to these global affairs. I don't believe in arm race because there's no logic behind it. If you challenge another country with an arm race, the reaction is never says, I give up. <laughs> the reaction is always counter arm race. So if that is the natural you know, 
uh, uh, consequence. The end has to be a conflict. The end has to be a war. And particularly, many wars we know in history are fought under wrong assumptions. That's the key. When assumptions wrong, the war is mistake. I don't know intelligence, uh, how you know each country collects them, but I think people nowadays have a lot more sort of vibes from communication, from information, for interaction, to feel what's like relationship with a country. We travel all over, we visit each other, there's so many intermarriages and so many adoptions of um, different you know, races, people. Those vibes tell you the assumptions are not so easily sort of uh, identified and crystallized as the people writing novels. We single out a country, direct something, uh, and then we have our policies and foreign policies direct accordingly. Now, we, of course, have one current example that we have been into war in Middle East. And there are now hindsight. War is started on the wrong assumption. Now we are now before <laughs> even people have any evidence. We're making assumption that, hey, one Cold War is over, we should have another Cold War, and we should target one country, and let's play this country against another country. I mean, even that selfishness type of a policy, granted, may be beneficial to us, let's say. But I still believe picking partners it's not just random. I would rather pick China as a partner to maintain the peace in Asia than pick Japan with all this history behind, with all this denial of the war crimes, with now these extreme right avocation and, and claims. How, how, how would we do that? When I watch TV sometimes, I see our leaders making statements. I just wonder, what, the, what are the bases? Now, this visit, a visit, was low-key, so we don't know. We don't see how uh, Obama and Abe did shake hand and talk and give out a, a joint statement or not anything like that. But we do worry, though. There's got to be some conversation. There's got to be some agreement. I just hope that our president is smart enough to recognize this matter is very, very serious. And I don't think we should play with match when this, you know, conflict is already inflamed. I think we all see that China is rising up very fast and mastered manufacturing and exporting a lot of goods. But in reality, though, the standard of living in that country it's probably still 20, 30 years behind. And I believe even their leaders with corruption or without whatever, 
still would place the economic development for their people, standard of a living, as first priority. Unless, unless they are threatened. Any regime will be feeling you know, insecure if it's threatened. And why do we do that? Why do we want to place that threat to China rather than cooperate, help raise the standard of living of the Chinese people? You may say, well, why should we do that? Otherwise, we will lower up. No. The global economy depends on mutual collaboration. There got to be ways for people to make win-win. If we can't compete fairly, we will never win. We can't just use military to solve our problems. Don't you agree? Okay, time is up. I don't know whether uh, I made my sense or not, but I feel that I'm compelled to tell you the story, and I may even want to do this again. So thank you for watching. Uh, good night.